Come gather round the campfire and hear our ghostly tales of chilling terrors, darkest woes, and anything that goes bump in the night. So cuddle up with your best friend or dare it alone. The darkness is closing in and spirits are calling your name. This is Fireside Phantoms. All right, Carol, what are you going to tell us about today? Well, today I'm wrapping up the last of my haunted vacation travel blog. Oh, okay. (laughs) I call it a travel blog because that's kind (laughs) of what it sounds like. Um, This time in the south of France, where we explored the ancient medieval towns of Carcassonne and Minerve. Minerve. At least that's how the French pronounce it. (laughs) Did you ever read the book The Labyrinth by Kate Moss? Kate Moss wrote a book. No, not the, not the fashion person. <laughs> <laughs> no, that would be a big no. I've not read that book. It's Kate Moss, M-O-S-S-E. So it's a little <laughs> different. Very different. So that E okay. changes everything. <laughs> okay, good. Because, yeah, you had me going there for a minute. I'm like, it's Kate Moss. And then I'm like, wait. It's Kate Moss A. So this book is part of a series called the Lingua d'Or Trilogy. <laughs> Did you just grunt? <laughs> I, I tried. I tried to make it authentic. You sounded pretty good. Thank you. It was the first time I ever heard about the Cathars. And after reading it, it made me want to learn more about the people in this region of France who went through a terrible religious persecution by the Catholic Church. It's the always damn the Catholics. Catholics. I know. It's always the Catholics in my stories. <sighs> Stay in your lane, Catholics. I know. Even though the Cathars called themselves Christian, they were accused of being heretics. The book series is a work of fiction, but takes place around Carcassonne, and some of the historical details are very accurate. So I encourage everyone to read it. It's very good. The Cathars, whose name means pure ones, emerged as a Christian movement during the 12th century in Europe. Their beliefs, diverging significantly from mainstream Christianity, were considered heretical by the Catholic Church. The Cathars held a central belief in dualism, where there was always a great cosmic struggle between two gods, the god of the spiritual realm and then the god of the material realm, Earth. They saw the material world then, including the human body, as created by the evil god while the spiritual realm and anything connected with the astral plane was considered pure and holy ruled by the good God. They also had rejection of materialism, so the Cathars aimed to distance themselves from material temptations. They believed that spiritual purification and renunciation of earthly desires could lead to their salvation. They also believed in reincarnation. The concept of reincarnation was integral to Cathar beliefs. They thought that through successive lifetimes, the soul could attain a pure state and eventually break free from the cycle of rebirth to reunite with the divine. Becoming one with divine was the ultimate goal for them. The Cathars also led an ascetic lifestyle. They emphasized a simple way of life. Luxuries and excess were rejected, and the pursuit of wealth and possessions was discouraged. They were against killing any living thing, would not tolerate violence, and were vegetarians. Yay, Cathars. (laughs) While they did believe in Jesus, they preferred to conduct their own methods of worship and did not conform to traditional Catholic sacraments like baptism, communion, and marriage. They thought Jesus was a reincarnated angel inhabiting a human body, and many refused to have sexual relations except for the goal of having children. Boring. They believed in abstaining for long periods of time as it would lead to greater connection with God and the spiritual realm. It will definitely lead to a bigger orgasm. Well, clearly they haven't researched sex magic because that's (laughs) what the God of Earth always tells everyone. Like, Mm. you know, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. That sperm is very powerful. Very powerful. (laughs) Wow. Those who don't know the terrible history of the Cathars, let me just briefly catch you up to speed on the significance of this area. The city of Carcassonne was a strategic location set on a hill just down from the Pyrenees Mountains, which made it 
a crossroads for different civilizations and languages. Throughout its history, Carcassonne was inhabited by Romans, Visigoths, Moors, and Franks, among others. And these various cultures and languages contributed to the evolution of the city's name. Although there is a fun legend we did hear about regarding the city's name. It was a common war strategy during a siege of a city to avoid directly attacking and just surround the city, prolonging a standoff until one side, either the army or the citizens inside the city, ran out of food, water, or supplies. The legend goes that under the Saracens' rule, or Saracens' rule, the Frank army led by Charlemagne laid siege to the city. The widow of the former Saracen's chief, Lady Carcass, was said to be very clever and decided to trick the armies who were surrounding the city, getting more impatient and ready to attack. Even though the city was down to its last pig and very little wheat for bread, they fed it all to the pig. That poor pig. He's probably like, oh, my God, I'm next. Yeah. But did you hear what they did? They gave him the wheat. Yeah, yeah they gave him all the wheat. Because they want to plump him up. And then they tossed the pig over the wall down to the army below who saw when it split open that the pig had a full belly. Oh, that poor pig. I know. The enemy soldiers observing this spectacle believed that the city's defenders had enough resources to last indefinitely. So the enemy army abandoned the siege and retreated, giving up their attempt to capture Carcassonne. Brilliant. That little pig. That'll do. The city was saved, yeah. And it was said that when Charlemagne's army retreated, the lady heard bells of the city ringing out and someone shouted, Carcassonne, which means carcass rings. And so they gave it the name Carcassonne. Hmm. Well, when we went to the city of Carcassonne, there was a little carved statue into the front gate of this lady. But in reality, the name Carcassonne is believed to have evolved from the Latin term Carcasso, which uh, refers to a fortified place or stronghold. But back to the Cathars. Their attack in that region started due to the rapid spread of their movement, which alarmed the Catholic Church. Not only were they growing in number, but they had military leaders who were sympathetic and also had support from many noblemen. And most of the Cathars were spread about in this region, including Carcassonne. And at first, the church tried to send out delegates to persuade them to convert from their beliefs. The situation, though, escalated with a specific event, the death of Pierre de Casselmont. Oh, Do you like that? Oh, oh, oh. Oui, 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 oui. Who was a Catholic clergyman. Très bien. Yes. While it's important to note that historical accounts can vary, here's a summary of the events as they are commonly understood. In the early 13th century, Pierre de Castelnau was a papal legate appointed by Pope Innocent III and was charged with rooting out heretical beliefs and practices in the region. Castelnau's confrontational approach and fervent efforts to suppress heresy led to tensions between him and the local nobility, some of whom were sympathetic to the Cathar cause. In 1208, Castelnau was murdered while on a mission in the Languedoc region. The details of Castelnau's murder are not entirely clear. Some accounts suggest that he was assassinated by a member of the local nobility who had been angered by his actions and attitude or sympathetic individuals loyal to the Cathars' peaceful way of life. However, others believe that the murder may have been orchestrated by the Pope himself as a way to justify an all-out crusade against the Cathar people. Pope Innocent III used Castelnau's murder as a pretext to launch a full-scale military campaign that would last a full 20 years against the Cathars and their supporters in the Languedoc region. In 1209, he declared a crusade against the heretics, leading to the Albigensian Crusade, also known as the Cathar Crusade. The crusade involved both military forces and the establishment of the Inquisition to identify and suppress heresy. The first city they attacked with a force of 10,000 armed crusaders was Beziers, who was caught completely off guard and only a handful was able to flee to the walled, fortified city of Carcassonne. It was proudly announced that 20,000 people were massacred in that one event. Jeez. When the soldiers attempted to distinguish Cathars from Catholics, the crusade commander Arnaud Almeric is known for his famous quote saying, Kill them all! God will distinguish them. Whoa. End quote. He's got some bad karma coming to him. Absolutely. 
This horrific massacre brought public slander and outrage towards the persecution, and the commander was replaced by Simon de Montfort, who listened to a man by the name of Raymond Roger, who petitioned for the people's lives in Carcassonne to be spared. The result was a full surrender of the city. They were forced to leave the town naked in just their britches, leaving everything they owned behind. Many just fled to the next town, though, only to be killed there months later. Minerve, though a small village atop a rocky plateau about an hour from Carcassonne, in 1210 resisted the crusaders but eventually surrendered due to the armies cutting off their water supply. They should have just thrown a jug of water over the wall and said, oh, we've got plenty of water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could they have just learned yeah, come on. from Lady Carcass? Carcass. Exactly. Well, it was the site of what was considered the first mass burning of the Cathars. Bonfires were lit, and the Cathars who refused to renounce their beliefs were forced into the bonfires to meet their fate. Despite the horrific death awaiting them, most people, including children, volunteered to walk themselves peacefully into the fire. Jeez. That is some courage That's, right yeah. there. Ooh, it was a painful way to go, too. Yeah. I think their belief in the spirit world helped them shed any attachment to their physical life. And perhaps they thought they wouldn't reincarnate if they did that. You know, I would surely be thinking that. Sure. As part of our trip, we were able to go to these towns, including the last door castles, which also was a part of the strategic locations attacked in routing out all the heretics. At Minerve, we got to see the probable spot of the burning, which was located near a mouth of a cave just outside the village. People who are aware of the site have balanced rocks known as carns, and I attempted to make my own set of balanced rocks there. It is one of the prettiest little medieval villages in France, and it felt very peaceful despite their gruesome history. The people of the town own shops there, and it is widely open for tourists to visit. Now, the last stronghold was the town of Montségur, which held out the longest fighting, a nine-month siege until being taken over in March of 1244. Most of the Cathars were eradicated after the burning of Montségur, and yet small forts and villages were still vul vulnerable to attacks until 1321, when the last known Cathar burning occurred at Kiribas. Historians have recorded that the total massacre was around, at the very least, 200,000 people, oh. but most likely closer to a million total lives lost. Jeez. There is a book written by Arthur Gerdeham, a well-known, respected British psychiatrist who used hypnosis in his practice and who was also a strong believer in extrasensory perception and reincarnation. He had a strange encounter with one patient in 1962, which he identifies as Mrs. Smith to respect her privacy. She was seeking out help from nightmares involving a shadowy man entering her room at night. Now, I'm going to mention that character references for this doctor have shown him to be very honest, and despite his fringe beliefs, does follow the scientific process for conclusions regarding his hypothesis of reincarnation. In this particular case, it, it didn't really seem an uncommon event to the doctor because many people have nightmares. But he was particularly interested because of some of what she said to him he was also experiencing in his personal life. For most of his life, he had experienced nightmares where a strange man approached him where he lay sleeping. The dream never had a story or went any further, but he always woke up drenched in sweat, terrified and screaming. The lady also said her dreams ended in the same sick feeling of dread. So she was also sensing a man coming to her and it was similar enough that they talked about it and they were like, this is very odd. So Geardham also had a very strange fascination. Um, you would almost say borderline obsession with the area of France known as the Pyrenees. He also began studying about the region and learned about the massacre of the Cathars. In 1963, when he met with the lady, he casually mentions the Cathars to Mrs. Smith. She replied saying she recently, randomly, came across a book on the subject and has been engrossed in learning all about them. She told the doctor before learning of the Cathars she had visited the Pyrenees herself and that the region always gave her a feeling of deja vu, as if she had familiarity with the place and an uneasy feeling of anxiety and sadness. 
The lady begins to trust the doctor and decides to tell him some of her feelings that they are somehow connected to that region and may have had a past life together there. She continues with strange details of people and dreams she has of a different time where she thinks she was a Catholic girl named Purella and his name was Roger. Now, I haven't read this book and to me it sounds a bit suspect, but her detailed knowledge of 13th century life and events and circumstances were amazing. They weren't known to historians at the time, only until years later after her past life memories were told. Because of these events, author Geardham decided to publish his accounts detailing all of her experiences called The Cathars and Reincarnation. He also published a second book, We Are One Another, where Geardham continues to research people and found a group of Cathars who might have all reincarnated at the same time to contemporary England. All of these subjects contain detailed memories and accurate traumatic stories that historians have found remarkably accurate. He describes how all of these people had coincidental contacts and brief connections with each other, proving that the people that you meet in your life are typically a sole group of individuals who reincarnate with you life after life. So do the Catholics know that these people were never eradicated from the face of the earth? Because they might want to get back on that and make Catholics, sure. Catholics, if you're listening, please these, don't report These reincarnated these Cathars are still around and time to get to work. I think they're working on new groups to eradicate at this point. I think <laughs> they've moved away. No, I'm, I'm sorry if you're Catholic. Yeah. I, I mean you no harm. Just a joke. So this is such a remarkable story. I'm very compelled to read it. It, yeah, it really, it sounds you know, really piqued my interest. Yeah. But my and question. I, I agree with that. I think that we are in soul groups that you re-experience mm-hmm. life after life with. Yeah, for sure. My question would be, you know, I bet you all, you know, the you reincarnated Cathars are upset that after such a huge sacrifice and act of faith, you would still have to be reincarnated. I bet that's a real bummer to wake up and be like, oh, I'm here again. Well, isn't it all part of the evolutionary process of the soul that you're here to learn and grow as a soul? No, I agree. But I mean, the ultimate, I think. Oh, because you, you're saying that they went into the fire thinking they would not be reincarnated. I'm thinking this so. ultimate sacrifice means that they're all done. I maybe, would think so. Maybe that's not how you stop reincarnation. Because you're choosing a life beyond the material you're choosing your faith right but you can always come, above it but once you die and you go to the afterlife mm-hmm. then they'll say well your soul still can grow wouldn't you want to do that and then they're like oh yeah my soul does still want to grow I'll, I'll, I'll go back i can see how they might change their mind it might be like you know we survived burning what else you know is is what there? else can What's they worse? throw what else Nothing. can they throw at us yeah yeah Well, guys, if you get a chance to visit Carcassonne, you must arrive after everything shuts down and walk through the gates all alone. Mm -hmm. It will feel like you got transported back in time as the medieval city stands strong with original Roman built walls and much of later constructs still standing. The city is gorgeous. It stands open at night and there's an amazing view as you peer down at the surrounding neighborhoods. Where is it at in France? It's in Carcassonne, um, kind of right over the border of the Pyrenees Mountains from Spain. We did not get a chance to go to the small village of René Le Chateau, which is located near Carcassonne in the Languedoc region of France. Now, René Le Chateau gained widespread attention due to its connection with a mystery and alleged hidden treasure. The village and its enigmatic story were indeed featured in Dan Brown's novel, The Da Vinci Code. Yay. Yes. But long before the Da Vinci Code novel was written, the Cathars believed that Mary Magdalene had lived in their region after being driven out of the Holy Land. Supposedly, she and about 70 other disciples crossed the Mediterranean by boat. There are supposed initials of Mary Magdalene etched out in locations across towns and in caves of southern France. The Cathars would teach in their secret meetings that Mary Magdalene was the wife of Christ. There are many shrines and cathedrals dedicated to Mary Magdalene. The René La Chateau mystery involved a 19th century priest named Berenger Saunière, who served as the parish priest of the village. In the late 1800s, Saunière supposedly discovered something of great value, which some believe to be a hidden treasure, while conducting renovations in the local church. The nature of the discovery has sparked numerous theories, including speculations about possibly finding the Holy Grail, the Ark of the Covenant, or lost Templar riches. 
Sonnieri's newfound wealth led to extensive renovations of the church and his surrounding property, with some suggesting that the priest used secret codes and symbols to convey information about the treasure's location. This has contributed to the mystique and intrigue surrounding René Le Chateau. While the story of hidden treasure and secret codes has captured the imagination of many, it's important to note that no concrete evidence of a significant treasure has been found, and much of the narrative remains speculative. Nonetheless, René Le Chateau has become a pilgrimage site for treasure hunters, conspiracy theorists, and those intrigued by historical mysteries. In The Da Vinci Code, author Dan Brown drew on elements of the René Le Chateau mystery, weaving it into the novel's plot to create an atmosphere of mystery and intrigue. The popularity of the book further fueled interest in the real-life René Le Chateau mystery. However, if you're inspired, you can venture to read a book by Jane Schauberg called The Resurrection of Mary Magdalene, which to me is a more mature way of viewing her contributions and going above the traditional view of prostitute and lover of Jesus. Hmm. During our stay in Carcassonne, I had an unusual experience. We had reserved a room in a rented home called La Maison de l'Ambassador. Upon our arrival, we were informed that there was an issue with our chosen room due to a water leak resulting in stains on the ceiling. The owners needed time to investigate the problem, so as compensation, they provided us with a complimentary upgrade to their master suite. Exciting for us, right? Right. Well, hold on. <laughs> Let me explain. Okay. On our first night, as we settled into the upgraded suite, something struck me as strange. Unlike other hotels, this time we were the sole guests in the house. This solitude, combined with the unfamiliar surroundings, created an eerie silence. Hmm. An uncommon experience for me, accustomed to the bustling city of Portland. And you found out that the water stains on the ceiling were really blood stains from the prior <laughs> ja, ja, guests? Ja. What? Wow, way to make my story so irrelevant. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's such a better tale that you're telling. <laughs> no, but after a few hours of sleep, I was awakened by what seemed like a light, persistent tapping sound at my window. Tap, tap. Thank you. Tap. Yes, just like that. Our room had a balcony on the second floor that faced an outdoor terrace away from any public street. Feeling a bit disoriented, I recalled the spooky scenarios from Scooby-Doo, prompting me to <laughs> do... <laughs> <laughs> that's what would come to yeah. my mind <laughs> oh this reminds me of the time that scooby and shaggy captured that boating captain who was just like a monster huh. yeah so in, in remembering you know the spooky scenarios from scooby-doo it prompted me to do what any curious investigator like velma would do <laughs> get up and explore my husband remained sound asleep, so I cautiously approached the window, suspecting it might be a branch tapping against the glass. I parted the curtain and peered outside. No one was in sight. And there was no trees in proximity to touch the window. Puzzled, I dismissed it as my imagination and returned to bed. Mm -hmm. But just as I was dozing off, I heard a soft ping, ping, ping. And this you heard time, a voice go, Carol. No. I didn't hear that. This time, the sound appeared to be emanating from within the room and had slightly a metallic quality. Mm -hmm. This time, I did wake up my husband and asked if he could hear the noise. Naturally, as soon as he listened, the sound vanished, leading him to reassure me that old houses do often make strange noises. Convinced, I resolved to sleep once more. However, about 15 minutes later, the soft ping, 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 returned. No, there was no whispering at that time. <laughs> Determined to unravel the mystery, I scanned the room for the source. Finding no dripping water, ruling out any other possibilities, I realized perhaps it was a small lamp by our bed. It had a metal cord that might be causing the sound. Yet I couldn't comprehend how something so weighty could move without the presence of a breeze, especially since I would have noticed an open window or a strong air conditioner. So I finally fell asleep again, only this time to dream that the portrait of an unfamiliar man hanging on the wall over my bed was communicating with me. In my dream, his lips moved as if he were underwater, muttering words I couldn't decipher. Carol. No, he wasn't saying that. I think he was. He wasn't. Morning arrived with daylight and everything seemed normal. 
I continued with my day, enjoying the sights and experiences Carcassonne had to offer. The next evening, I was so tired, I slept through the night. But the next morning, I did notice the portrait of the man had somehow been knocked and now was hanging slightly crooked. I fixed it and didn't think twice about it until reflecting on my stay there. So despite the peculiar events, I wholeheartedly recommend a stay at La Maison de la (laughs) Ambassador. The owners are delightful, offering a sumptuous breakfast spread and sharing their enthusiasm for the local wineries in the region, even if the place does come with a few friendly ghosts. Did you take a picture of the portrait? I wish I did. I don't think I did. Maybe I can find one online. It was creepy. I bet. The portrait was just this old man dressed in old-fashioned clothing, and he was just staring out, like, just with a blank face. You know, no smile. It's because he was speaking to you. He was judging me. He was watching me as I slept. He was like, it was super freaky. I'll throw up some pics on Instagram again and a link to the place if you want to stay there. Ghost yeah. hunters. I bet you people go, are lining go, up. Go, go, Lining up to stay there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they will be now. Definitely. <laughs> well, my God, what a trip that was. You got, what, five or six really good stories. <laughs> I know. Thank five God for podcast that. podcast episodes. You should just thank, write this trip off. Yeah, well, thank God because, you know, I didn't have time to write. So my it was gosh. all good. I was just all there in my, in my mind. all memories. Boom, boom. Nice. What do you have for us? Well, it's not anything European, that's for sure. Thank God, and no hard to <laughs> pronounce words. Josh, I am so sorry. That was awful. Absolutely was awful fine. for you. It was I fine. hope that you, I hope you do a good job. Thank you. <laughs> well, I am doing the Great Train Avalanche of Wellington, Washington. So the town of Wellington, Washington is the home of the worst Avalanche disaster in the history of the United States of America, Carol. That was very dramatic, Holly. (laughs) Thank (laughs) Thank you. you. I thought I needed to really like drum it in there. Founded in 1893, Wellington sits 3,100 feet up in the Cascade Mountain Range, just west of Stevens Pass. In those days, the railroad had built a track that ran through Wellington connecting towns like Spokane to the big city of Seattle. In the late end of February of 1910, a passenger train heading from Spokane to Seattle was making its way along the tracks when it got stuck in a terrible blizzard just outside of the town of Wellington. It stopped at a train depot as the massive blizzard raged around it. Another train was also stopped at the depot, which was a, quote, fast mail, end quote, train. Uh, The train company was working diligently to clear the tracks with railroad snowplows, but could not keep up with the intense snowstorms. On some days, Carol, the area received as much as 12 inches of snow per hour, and it was estimated that as much as 11 feet of snow fell in a single day. The trains and the passengers were stuck on board for days. Everybody was frustrated and wanted to get back to Seattle, but there was nothing the railroad workers could do. The passengers were starting to run low on food and supplies, and the train conductor was starting to run low on coal to keep the train warm. The train sat at the top of a cliffside with a sharp incline just below it. It was believed at that time that where the trains were sitting was the safest place for them, as that particular area had never had an avalanche before. However, the summer beforehand, a major wildfire had swept through the area and cleared out the trees from heavy branches that typically held back large snowpacks in the winter. Little did everyone know that the trains were in the perfect spot for a major avalanche. Then an avalanche did hit both in front of and behind the trains, shutting down any escape in either direction via the railroad tracks. After about five or six days of waiting, a small group of passengers got fed up and left the train. They were able to hike down the very steep slope to another town in the valley below. The next day, the conductor, Joseph Pettit, and another group of men also left the train. Pettit was trying to see if the slope would be passable to take everybody off the train and get them to the town below. He was able to hike down the steep drop-off, though how in snow and ice, I have no idea. 
Pettit decided that taking the passengers down the steep slope would work and it would be the best course of action for his passengers. The next day, he managed somehow to get back up the cliff to the train. But at this point, it was getting late in the day. So he made a plan to evacuate everyone the next day. However, that night, just about 1.30 a.m. on March 1st, 1910, a new storm moved into the area. This was a thunderstorm, which is kind of freaky for the middle of winter. With it came warm rain and lightning. Weird. Yeah. The rain started to pour down and the snow started to loosen up. Then a lightning strike hit a large sheet of snow and ice at the top of the mountain. And suddenly a six acre quarter mile wide wall of snow descended down the mountain. The avalanche crashed directly onto both the passenger train and the fast mail train and pushed them both another 200 feet down the side of the mountain. Oh, man. It also hit the train depot. Tons of snow rolled and buried the trains under its weight. And to make matters worse, a few of the snow plows and locomotive cars came crashing down on top of the trains as well. The passengers were buried and crushed. The people in the town of Wellington heard the tremendous crash of the avalanche and they rushed outside to see what had happened. They saw that the trains had disappeared from the tracks and had been swept under the snow. So they immediately grabbed their gear and headed to the site of the wreckage to try to dig people up. As they started picking away through the snow, ice, down trees, and twisted metal of the trains, they were able to find a few people who had managed to survive the disaster. They dug about 27 people out, many of which had severe injuries. However, the rest of the 96 plus passengers were not so lucky, including the conductor Pettit, who died oh. in the wreckage. Over the next couple of months, the men continued to dig more and more bodies out of the rubble. They loaded the dead bodies onto toboggans and then slid them down the sheer face of the cliff via rope 800 to 1,000 feet down to the town of Windy Point, gathering it the name Dead Man's Slide. Many of the bodies were so mangled that recognizing them by sheer sight was impossible. And there were many undocumented workers on the train, so it was unclear who everyone actually was. Eventually, they were able to find all of the bodies, the last one being dug out as late as July of that year. It was considered and still is considered to be the worst avalanche tragedy in the history of the United States. The tragedy was so immense, the town of Wellington had to change its name to Ty Washington, as no one wanted to take a train through Wellington, the place of the worst train avalanche disaster to ever occur. The following year, the train company had a snow shed built at the side of the avalanche to help protect trains from heavy snow in the area. The snow shed is essentially an open arched tunnel with solid roof covering for the trains to duck into that can protect them from big waves of avalanche snow. This worked for a short while until another tunnel, the Cascade Tunnel, was built and the whole rail line was moved away from the town of Wellington. So the Cascade Tunnel, I think, was going through an actual mountainside. Okay. Eventually, the town of Wellington, or Ty at this point, was deemed a ghost town and all of the buildings that stood there were burned to the ground. Without the railroad coming through, they didn't really have much life left to it. No. Now, the only thing left of Wellington slash Thai is the snow shed and what remains of the wreckage from the great train disaster of 1910. In present day, the Iron Goat Trail is how most people access the area via foot, though in the summer months you can get there by car. So, of course, this area has attracted many paranormal and ghost hunters to it. Many of the investigators claim to capture grainy ghost figures on film, ghostly swirls in photos, hear EVPs of children wanting to play, or a woman humming. They even claim to have heard a man singing in Italian, as many of the immigrants on the train were thought to be from Italy. Oh, wow. Many shadow figures have been seen as well as full-body apparitions. Visitors have also heard old-timey music and have been touched by something they cannot see. A husband and wife team named Bert and Jamie Coates head up the Northwest Paranormal Investigation Agency and have visited the site frequently. They have managed to collect stories from all sorts of people that have visited the area and have claimed to have encounters with the paranormal there. Even people who were total skeptics came away from the area as believers after what they experienced at Wellington. Others have claimed that when they tried to shoot footage of the area, their batteries would drain, as well as multiple lights, all on different power supplies and switches. They would shut off manually at the same time when no one, at least no one solid anyway, flipped those switches. 
Freaky. When switched back on, they all worked fine. In fact, it is common for people trying to record video or photos with their camera equipment, complaining of energy draining from brand new batteries, which is another hallmark of paranormal energy in a place. In 2022, one of my favorite paranormal shows went to Wellington, Washington. The TV show Expedition X on the Discovery Channel went to investigate the area. This show pairs a paranormal believer, Jessica Chabot, I think is how she says her name. Chabot. Chabot. She's Francais. En Francais. With a skeptic, Phil Torres, to investigate paranormal places. The two duke it out over what is actually going on at any place they investigate, with Jessica trying to prove it's paranormal and Phil trying to prove there is a natural and scientific explanation. Phil and Jessica interviewed Bert Coates of the Northwest Paranormal Investigation Agency. Bert was the one who had captured a ghostly image on his video camera at the snow shed. He also claims to have heard a disembodied voice of a woman. He says he actually didn't know the history of the place until after he found the creepy image on his video camera. That is when he started to research it and found out about the tragedy. Bert takes Jessica and Phil to the snow shed where he was able to capture the image. He then points over the ledge and tells them that the debris field is right below them. I don't know how steep that cliff is, but Jessica and Phil had to use ropes and scale down the side in order to reach it if it gives you any indication. Oh, no, I wouldn't be doing that. You can't that. just naturally hike down there. No way. When they climb down, they find there are still pieces of the wreckage strewn along the area. They can also tell that the forest has grown up over most of the debris, and they are most likely standing over a lot of buried train wreckage. Jessica tries to record some EVPs here, but her recorder starts to get very glitchy and does not record properly. Mm. Just like all the other equipment they've claimed has failed for other investigators. Very interesting. Yes. They then I wonder if there's an alien base in the mountain nearby. I hope so. They then return to the snow shed where Phil sets up some cameras with night vision to see if he can capture footage of animals in the area to prove that what Bert caught on camera was just an animal. Meanwhile, Jessica sets up a REM pod, which is a radiating EM antenna. Apparently, the way a REM pod works is it emits a low electromagnetic field that can detect energy changes. Did you know that? No. I didn't either. I had to look it up. <laughs> when it senses an energy change, it lights up and plays an audible tone to alert the user. Beep. Pretty much. So essentially, it's a ghost detector. Okay. Jessica also attempts another EVP session with a new recorder. As she is walking through the tunnel, she hears a whistle. So does Phil, even though he is in a different area. The whistle sounds like the kind of whistle someone would wear around their neck. Something train workers would have worn back in 1910. So you hear it in the show. You hear the whistle and it does kind of sound like that. But then you have to remember it's a reality show. Mm -hmm. Jessica and Phil both start to pick up on the creepiness of the place and felt somewhat nauseous, weird, and out of place. Phil thinks that perhaps that the rebuilt railway that is still active and not terribly far away may be having an impact on the sounds and the feelings via infrared sound that they are experiencing. Phil thinks that the train that travels down the new track is sending sound vibrations up the mountain, which make it sound like whistles and disembodied voices around the old crash site, which would explain what people have been hearing. Jessica and Phil go to interview Kevin Widerstrom, who is a retired Boeing employee and is somewhat of an expert on the Wellington train disaster. Kevin believes that there are many more people that were killed in the train disaster than just 96. He thinks it's closer to 150. But because there were so many undocumented transient workers, it was easy for the train company to cover it up, the actual number of the dead. So... After speaking with Kevin, Jessica and Phil return to the area to set up more of their equipment. Phil sets up a machine that can pick up on infrared sound. Phil says that people cannot hear infrared sound, but animals can. He said it has been proven in a lab that the vibrations that infrared sound produce can make people feel weird and even vibrate your eyeballs and make you see things. He wanted to see if the infrared sounds were causing the feelings of unease in the place. Phil also records audio from a train passing about a thousand feet below them to prove his theory that the noises people hear are from the trains passing by below. Jessica, on the other hand, sets up for another EVP session in the Cascade Tunnel, which is rather creepy. The tunnel is located close to the dead man's slide. While in the tunnel, Jessica is asking questions to the spirits 
but yanks her headphones off when she has an overwhelming sick feeling similar to what she and Phil had felt earlier. And her REM pod starts to light up. Jessica radios Phil to see if a train is coming by below them and if it is making his infrared sound machine go off. Phil confirms that his infrared machine showed a huge spike and a train was entering the area. Phil believes that infrared could be causing the feelings of disease in the area. However, Jessica points out that her REM pod does not react to infrared sound and it lit up just before she felt overwhelmed. So there could have been an energy change in the tunnel indicating ghosts. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Phil also thinks the passing trains are creating the strange disembodied voice sounds that people hear, but Jessica disagrees, saying that the whistle she heard was right next to her ear. Also, after reviewing the that footage... That would be painful. Yes, and so therefore it can't be a train a thousand feet away. Mm-mm. Also, after reviewing the footage of the animals in the area, none of them matched the object that Burke Coates captured on his video camera. However, the team did not record any EVPs or other evidence of ghostly activity, so they left with an inconclusive decision if the area is indeed haunted. The Wellington train disaster is considered to be one of the most haunted places in Washington state. Yeah, I like um, the fact it seemed like it was really legit. They didn't go overboard with their findings or any conclusion. But a lot of these shows, they never conclude anything, and I think it's on purpose. And probably. They want to bring people back. But did you... um, find if there was other people who got EVPs and all these other So they kind of interviewed a few people and I did try to find some other links on YouTube about people who've been there and recorded stuff. And they had a handful of paranormal investigators. It's kind of a remote area, so not a lot of people go there, but it is considered to be like the top three most haunted spots in Washington. I don't know. Um, I mean, something with that much tragedy, you would think that the train avalanche that incident alone would be recorded into the energy of the place. Mm-hmm. So hearing people's voices and whistles and that sort of thing, I would expect that because even though there may not be a ghost there, it may have recorded sounds of what happened yeah, on that day. Sure. So, but it's really cool. I would love to go up there sometime and in the summer mm-hmm. and kind of hike around Definitely up there. Definitely in the really summer. Cool. Don't want to yeah. risk an avalanche. No. <laughs> but if you're in the snow shed, you might be okay. Might be. Yeah. That was an awesome story. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was the great train avalanche disaster of Wellington, Washington. Choo, choo. Choo, choo. Choo um, on that one, guys. <laughs> that does it for us, you guys. We hope you have a good night. We'll see you next time. Sweet dreams. Good night. where we explored the ancient medieval towns of Carcassonne and Minerva. 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 Actually, I should look that up. Hang on. Voulez-vous avec back moss? What is so funny? I feel like I'm a history teacher. <laughs> Now, class, <laughs> we're going to discuss. Everyone get your books out and turn to chapter 12. Now, l- listen up. Oh, my God. I got to get it together. Get it together, Carol. <laughs> Don't make me come over there and slap you around. Please. <laughs> get, me, I get my head on straight. Including the human body as created by the evil God and inherently evil. <laughs> oh. Well, of course. Okay. I don't know why I wrote it that way. Mm. The widow of the former Saracen's chief. The widow of the former chief. No. (laughs) I have no idea how to say any of this shit. (laughs) I just, all I know is Pope Innocent is not so innocent. As if she had familiar, familiar, as a girl named Purielia or Puriella. Purielia. Purelia. Pure one of those weird French names. Fuck this. <laughs> okay, Josh, I'm going to start this over oh, again. Boy. And even vibrate your eyebells and make you see things. Eyebells. I'll say that again. <laughs> As the flames die down, do remain undaunted. Though all hitchhikers are ghosts and all dolls are definitely haunted. guys be sure to follow us on instagram our handle is at 
Fireside Phantoms. If you have a spooky story you would like to share with us, send it to firesidephantoms at gmail.com and you may hear it on a future episode.